Hi, this is Pastor Mark Wright of Evers Road Christian Church, and this is the pre-recorded sermon for Sunday, July 3rd, and we are having a patriotic service on this day. Uh, this pre-recording is especially for those of you of our Evers Road Christian Church family who, for whatever reason, whether you're traveling or ill, are unable to attend with us in person. We want to say we love you, we miss you, and we look forward to having you with us again, physically present in our worship service. Today we're going to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, and this is probably a verse that's going to be used across the nation in pulpits on this Sunday morning of the 4th of July weekend, the weekend where we celebrate Independence Day. And thank God for America. Thank God for this great country that he gave us. I love America and the people of Evers Road Christian Church. We love America, but we also recognize that America is in trouble. America is in a downward spiral of moral decline and moral decay and spiritual decline. And it breaks our heart because this great nation, which God has blessed, uh, is facing an uncertain future. So the long story short, the message this morning is to pray for our nation. Pray for America. Now, God sounded a very similar um, call to the nation of Israel thousands of years ago when Solomon dedicated the temple in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And it starts, that verse starts with the word if. If. Now, if introduces a condition. A promise will follow. But first, there are conditions to the promise. If. So if implies, it depends upon us to a certain point to fulfill the conditions and then God will do what he says. But God wants us to be participants. God wants us to participate in our own rescue if, if my people. Now we are blessed to be the people of God. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 9 and 10 the Apostle Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, calls the church a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. And those were terms used of the Israelites in the Old Testament and they're used for the church today. Now, don't get me wrong, the, the nation of Israel, the Israelites are, are God's people. Uh, however, we're also included in that number today when whoever calls upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now as far as America is concerned, uh, someone might say, well, America is a secular nation. It's not the people of God. Well, okay, fine. But make no mistake, the founding fathers were Christians. It was their worldview. If you do not believe that, I encourage you to check out the Wall Builders website with David Barton, and he will give you incredible historical evidence that the founding fathers had a Christian worldview. With that said, sadly, our nation is departing and turning away from God. There is still a remnant, a faithful remnant in America, churches that have not watered down the gospel, Christians that have not compromised, Christians that are living holy lives, and Christians that love the Lord with all of their heart. If my people, so it depends upon us whether God will hear our prayers and forgive our sins and heal the land depends upon God's people, not on the pagans. The, the condition isn't for pagans or un, unconverted people, people that are not born again, secular people. This verse is not for those people. This verse is for God's people. This is true for God's people in every land, and it's true for God's people today in America. If my people who are called by my name, and what a pleasure and privilege what a blessing it is to be called by the name of the Lord. Now, what is the name of the Lord? Well, God said, I am who I am. God identifies himself as Yahweh, Jehovah. Uh, but the, when the Bible uses the name, the, when, when the Bible uses the phrase, my name, when God uses that phrase, he's referring to his being, his existence, his essence. And that's what name means, the person of God. It means we are so intimately identified with him because he is our father and we are his children. If my people who are called by my name, and what a privilege it is to be called by the name of God, to belong to God, to be his children, will humble themselves. Now here it begins. Will humble themselves. By the way, that's important for all relationships. It's also important for our relationship with God because we are flawed sinners. 
And there's no way that we can get right with God. There's no way that we can approach God without first humbling ourselves. You cannot recognize your sin if you do not first humble yourself. If you're proud and arrogant and self-righteous, you cannot come into the presence of, the, of, the God, of God Almighty because you do not have the right heart. You do not have a contrite heart. You're not able to recognize your own sin. We must humble ourselves and by the way this is important in all human relationships whether it's a marriage or a friendship in a relationship there's a place for us to humble ourselves because sooner or later you will offend someone that you love and the only way to recognize that and to make amends to to ask for forgiveness the only way to to fix that is by humbling yourself pride can ruin any relationship Pride can destroy your relationship with God, and pride can destroy your relationship with people. Pride can destroy your marriage. Some people, you're just too proud. You just have too much pride. And rather than saying, I love you, and making yourself vulnerable, and saying, I need you, and I, and I ask for forgiveness, instead you say, I don't need you, I don't care about you, that's pride. Too often that's pride, and it is destructive of relationships. It's destructive of our relationship with God. In order to draw near to God, in order to be right with God, you must humble yourself. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, pray, speak to God, talk to God. God wants you to pray. How much time do you spend in prayer? How much time do you spend on your knees? How much time do you spend meditating and praying to God? God wants you to pray. And that is the key for God blessing our land. His people must humble themselves. We must humble ourselves and we must pray. You need to humble yourself and you need to pray. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Too often today, people are not seeking God's face. And in all relationships, seeking the other person's face is significant because it entails a direct communication. When you're looking in someone's eyes, when you're looking in the eyes of that loved one, and you can see their facial expression, and you're trying to communicate, you're trying to bond, you're trying to draw closer to each other, God wants you to do that too. God wants you to seek his face. Think of eye-to-eye -eye contact. Think of face-to-face -face contact. That's what God wants. He wants you to focus. He wants you to concentrate on Him. He wants you to draw near to Him. Now, on a human level, uh, one of the biggest obstacles we have to seeking each other's face, face-to-face -face contact and building relationships, sadly, is technology. Now, technology is wonderful in its place. Technology is great. But too often we spend so much time with technology that we do not seek each other's face. We do not have a face-to-face -face conversation, a face-to-face -face relationship, and technology is, has replaced it. Uh, it. It's said that your cell phone has already replaced your camera. It's replaced your agenda. It's replaced your calendar. It's replaced your video camera. Uh, it's replaced your word processor. Don't let it replace your relationships. There's a place for technology, but there's also a time and a place to turn it off and to focus on each other. Too often, screen time robs us of face-to-face -face intimacy. Seek face-to-face -face intimacy and seek intimacy with God. Seek His face. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. You're talking about an intimate relationship there. You're talking about a close relationship there. It's in a close relationship that you look at each other face to face and you talk and you discuss things and you share the intimate needs in your heart. Seek my face. God wants you to do that. God wants you to seek his face. And then the last phrase, in turn from their wicked ways. God wants you to turn. He wants you to turn from sin. So you must humble yourself. You must search your heart. You must recognize your sin. And you must turn 
from your sin. Turn from your sin. That means you no longer persist in that sin. You quit. You stop sinning. You quit sinning. You turn from your sin. God's talking about a U-turn here. That's what repentance is. Recognizing your sin, yes. Feeling sorry about your sin, yes. You do that. Confessing your sin to God, yes. But it also means turning from your sin so that you no longer do it. You no longer practice that sinful thing. Uh, once I was traveling with my family in Mexico, north of Mexico City, I believe we were in the state of San Luis Potosí. There wasn't much out there. It was a desolate area. It was undeveloped. There weren't many landmarks, so to speak, of. And so we pulled over to a gas station to get gas as the first stop in, in tens in, in uh, many, many miles. We pulled in to get gas. We had our pit stop. And after about 15 minutes, we got back on the road. And instead of turning the right way, I turned the wrong way. Instead of turning right and continuing our journey north, I turned left and went south. And I didn't even realize it. No one in my family realized it. Of course, it was my fault. And we drove. And we drove and we drove. There weren't many landmarks out there. There weren't many signs. We were on the highway. But instead of going north, we were going south, and we drove, and we drove. And after about an hour, I finally started thinking something was wrong. I started suspecting something was wrong, and I started asking myself, did I pull out of that gas station and go the wrong way? Are we going the wrong direction? Are we going south rather than north? And finally, I found a landmark, a sign that, that proved without a shadow of doubt that for at least an hour, we had been driving the wrong way. Now, I want to tell you, that was very frustrating. I was upset at myself. We just lost not one hour, but two hours to backtrack that much time. We lost two hours going the wrong way, not to speak of the gas and the patience of my family. But as soon as I could, I made a U-turn and we started going the correct way. And that's what repentance is. Repentance is not recognizing it. That's, that's an important step, but that in itself is not the essence of repentance. The essence of repentance is not feeling sadness, even though that's an important step. You should feel sadness when you repent. But the essence of repentance is more than recognizing your sin and more than feeling sadness. The essence of repentance is when you decide in your heart, you, you make a decision, I'm going to turn around. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to give up sin. I'm going to live a life of holiness. I'm going to live a life of righteousness. I'm going to obey God rather than disobey God. I'm going to live for God rather than reject God. That is repentance when you make the U-turn. And yes, we had to backtrack for another hour, and, and we lost two hours, but we made our way finally to our destination in northern Mexico. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Notice the word wicked. We live in a day when people call evil good and good evil. But know this, God will not rewrite the Bible for this generation. Just because this generation has rejected God's word and rejected God's truth, God is not going to rewrite the Bible. God is not going to change. He didn't for Sodom. He didn't for Gomorrah. He didn't for the ancient world destroyed in the flood of Noah. He's not going to do it today. God will not rewrite the Bible. And know this too. Wrong is wrong even when everyone is doing it. And right is always right even when no one is doing it. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. And that's what America needs to do. We need to pray that America will do this that Americans will humble themselves, that more Americans will pray, that more Americans will seek God's face, and that more Americans will turn from their wicked ways. We need to pray that prayer for America, and then let's see what God will do. Then I, notice the word I, God is the one who will take action here. And the first part was about us. If we will do these things, then God will do certain things. Then I, God is the one acting. Then I, Yahweh, Jehovah, the Almighty God, the one who said, I am who I am, then I will hear from heaven. God hears, and that's a wonderful thing. We have a God who will hear our prayers. When we humble ourselves, when we pray, when we repent of our sins, when we seek his face, when we turn from our wicked ways, God will hear from heaven. Now, that's huge. Try and get Austin to hear from you. 
the government in Austin. You might be able to achieve that. Try and get Washington, D.C. to hear from you. Probably isn't going to happen very easily. But God will hear from heaven when you humble yourself, when you pray, when you seek his face, and when you turn from your wicked ways, God hears from heaven. And there's nothing greater than that. That's greater than Washington hearing from you. That's greater than the Capitol and Austin hearing from you. That's greater than anything. Your congressman, your representative, your senators hearing from you. No. When God hears, that's the greatest thing. I will hear from heaven. And I will forgive their sins. Praise God for the forgiveness of sin. Praise God that he cleanses us and removes our sins so that before him we are justified and we are innocent and righteous in his sight. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. No condemnation. I will forgive their sin. A promise from God. He forgives our sin. And it doesn't matter what you've done. Last week we talked about some pretty terrible sins, but it doesn't matter where you've been and what you've done. God promises, I will forgive their sin. What a wonderful blessing to have forgiveness. What a wonderful blessing to be forgiven. We are forgiven through Jesus. The blood of Jesus is powerful to take away all of our sin. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their sin land. Now, there may have been an agricultural uh, meaning there that the, the crops had failed and there hadn't been enough rain, and God would fix that. Uh, God would send rain. God would miraculously bless the crops so that the crops would yield abundant food for the people. And no, no doubt it has that connotation. But I think there's also a spiritual meaning here when it says, and will heal their land because in a spiritual sense our land is sick in a moral sense our land is sick because our land has turned away from God and turned towards evil the people of our land have loved darkness and hated the light the people of our land have rejected God and turn towards evil. We live in a day when, just as Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20 says, people call evil good and good evil. And our land needs to be healed. God promises he will heal our land when his people, it doesn't depend upon the unbelievers, it depends upon the believers, his people, those who are born again, when his people will humble themselves when we will humble ourselves, when we will pray, when we seek his face, when we turn from our wicked ways, then he, God, will hear up from heaven. He will forgive our sins and he will heal our land. We need that today. Pray for America. Pray for America. Ask God to bless America and ask God to work in a powerful way through the Holy Spirit and through the preaching of his word so that men and women across this great nation will turn back to God. This is Pastor Mark Wright of Evers Road Christian Church. I want to wish you a happy 4th of July weekend. Happy Independence Day. God bless.